Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. It has been our uh, tremendous joy to have Dr. Michael Block with us this weekend. Uh, if you were not able to make uh, Friday night or Saturday night, the uh, audio CDs are, are, are ready, and you can pick them up to the media center uh, this morning. But it's our joy to have Dr. Vlock, and I want to pray for him before he comes and speaks to us this morning. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for the things that we have received this weekend. I thank you for Dr. Vlock. I thank you, Lord, for his life, for his ministry. I thank you for the preparation that he has made to teach us this weekend. And I thank you for the things that we have already received. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen him in body and in mind as he shares with us in this hour and in the one to follow. I pray, Lord, that you would work in his heart and mind in such a way that the things that he desires to share with us from your word uh, come to him with ease and, and God just grant him great ability as he uh, serves as your instrument this morning and teach us through him today. We will thank you for what you do in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Caldwell. And it's good to be with you again. I'm sure we have a mix of people who have uh, been to some of the other sessions this weekend, and some of you may be new, uh, new to, I guess, to this series that we're doing. Uh, we're doing a, uh, uh, this series on uh, the relationship between Israel and the church. So those of you who have been here, you know that we've been looking at a lot of passages. And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand God's big picture purposes in regard to the people of God and how that relates to Israel and the church. And, you know, of course, the, the title of this is, is, has been, you know, Has the Church Replaced Israel? So we've spent a lot of time looking at a lot of passages dealing with the is, issue of Israel. Um, but I just before we even get into looking specifically um, at uh, the message today, I just wanted to mention to you what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter 5, and, and starting in verse 17. And 18, because I think this is, this is significant, because as we discuss the Israel church issue, we're dealing with this issue, you know, is God going to fulfill what he said? In other words, what he has promised to do, not only for Israel and for the Gentiles and for the church, is he going to accomplish these things just as he said? And really, I think that's at, at what's at stake with this issue concerning replacement theology or, you know, the view that the church has replaced Israel. Can it be the case that God promises certain things to certain people, and then does something different? And I think the answer to that is no. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus made a statement, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. And really, when you put those together, the law and the prophets, that's referring to the entirety of the Old Testament. He did not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but what he goes on to say in verse 17, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And that doesn't mean all the details get absorbed into Jesus as if the details don't mean anything anymore. Because if you read Matthew 24, you'll see that in the future he talks about all these Old Testament prophecies that need to come true. But Jesus has come to make sure that everything that is promised in the Scripture is fulfilled. He says in verse 18, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And again, with that second use of law, that's still referring to an entire summary um, of the Old Testament. So that's important to understand that Jesus viewed all the things that the Scripture predicted, including those things pertaining to Israel and then eventually blessings to Gentiles in the church as needing to be fulfilled. And we'll see later in the message of when we talk about Romans 11 that the surety of what God is doing for us is, again, based on his character and on his word, and the fact that he keeps his promises to the nation Israel is a great assurance to us that he will keep his promises to us exactly as he said, and that he will not change his mind or do something different. So with that in mind, we will look at this, uh, for this uh, session here, we're going to continue on with something that I actually began last night. So if you're here for the first time, uh, this is something that we actually started yesterday. It's kind of like a two-part message that I started. And I, I'm dealing here with reasons why replacement theology is not a biblical doctrine. Again, if you haven't been here, replacement theology would be the view that the church has replaced Israel. 
And that is something that we, uh, you know, we reject replacement theology. We believe that God has a future for Israel, for the nation Israel, um, and that that plan extends also to, to Gentiles and the church. So uh, I introduced point one yesterday, and you know, there's 12 reasons why I would say that replacement theology is not a biblical doctrine. And the first one is because there's many Old Testament passages that explicitly teach the restoration of the nation Israel. Uh, yesterday we talked about the fact that God is going to save Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, there was the promise that he was going to uh, circumcise their hearts so that they would have a desire to obey him. Uh, and when that occurs, um, there's going to also be a return to the land and physical blessings associated with that. Uh, yesterday we also looked at Ezekiel 36, which like Deuteronomy 30 also predicts that there's going to be a salvation of the people of Israel and that God is going to put his spirit within them and give them a new heart. We looked at Isaiah chapter 49, which talks about Jesus' role in all this. Again, as we're talking about Israel, the fulfillment of Israel's promises is going to be linked with the ultimate Israelite, Jesus the Messiah. So we saw that in Isaiah chapter 49, verses 3 to 6 at the end of our message last night, that all of this is going to occur, all the, the promises and covenants um, come via the Messiah, Jesus, who makes all things happen. And we saw in that Isaiah passage that Jesus is the true Israel, he's the servant Israel, and what he does is he restores Israel and brings blessings to the Gentiles. So when we talk about God's plans for Israel, they're inseparably tied to Jesus, who's the ultimate and true Israel. Now, there was a, uh, another passage that I wanted to look at in regard to this first point, that the Old Testament teaches the restoration of Israel. And one of these is in a, uh, you know often overlooked book, Zephaniah. You know, Zephaniah is one of the, you know, the major prophets that's way towards the back of your Bible. Uh, you, know, you have Malachi, which is the last book of the Bible, and Zechariah. So if, if you were to find Malachi and Zechariah before Matthew and then go back a little bit, you'll, you'll find uh, Zephaniah. Um, but I wanted to uh, read for you some of what's found in chapter 3, particularly in verses 14 to 20. Uh, in Zephaniah uh, chapter 3, verse 14, we're told, Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. And then notice at the end of verse 15, it says, The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. So when this prophecy is fulfilled, this, the king of Israel, and we, you know, we would understand this to be a reference to Jesus and his kingdom reign upon the earth, that when all these things are occurring, um, the clearing away of enemies and the Lord taking away of his judgments, the king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. Verse 16, In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. And then if you look down to verse 19, it says, Behold, I'm going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. So notice at this particular time, this is dealing with earthly conditions with the Messiah's kingdom. At that time, I will bring you in, even at the time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So again, another great passage where it talks about the king being on earth in their midst and there being a restoration of Israel taking place among the nations. Um, I guess one other passage in regard to this first point that we would want to look at would be um, also in the Minor Prophets, and that's going to be in Amos chapter 9. So Amos is going to be pretty close to here if you go a little bit to the, to the left in your Bible. In Amos chapter 9, uh, verses 11 to 15, uh, we're told that in that day, uh, this is Amos 9, 11, in that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. 
that they may possess the remnant of Eden, Edom. And then notice the next part of verse 12. And all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does this. And that's important there because in this passage, which is uh, discussing the restoration of Israel and the rebuilt Davidic kingdom, it talks about the, the fact here that the nations are going to be called by my name. And this is something that will actually be picked up by um, in Acts chapter 15, verses 14 to 18, when we see that salvation is going to Gentiles, we will see that um, there's a partial fulfillment of this taking place at this time. But it's important, to, again, to understand something that I've emphasized in the other messages is God is working with Israel. It's not just everything of being about Israel or just for Israel. Israel is a vehicle for, and a means for blessing the families of the earth. And we see that the Gentiles are going to be called by uh, God's name. Now, when you look at verses 13 to 15, there's descriptions here which talk about the restoration of Israel, things that I think would be fulfilled at the time of the second coming of Christ. We're told, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed, when the mountains will drip sweet wine and all the hills will be dissolved. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel. So notice there uh, the concept of restoration. And they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord your God. So again, notice when this restoration of Israel takes place, it's in the context of them being restored to their land. And as we saw earlier, this also involves the nations being, uh, being blessed as well. So... So anyway, just to reiterate with this first point as we're getting ready to move on, I'm just going to move up the chart here just to uh, reemphasize this point. And again, if you weren't here yesterday, you might want to get the, uh, the recording of that because I spent a lot more time on this particular point. We want to affirm that you know, the idea of a restoration, a salvation and restoration of the nation Israel is explicitly taught in the Bible uh, in many, many passages and as we mentioned with the Matthew passage where Jesus says that we should expect every letter um, of what was written in the scripture to be fulfilled, we can know that those passages will be as well. Now, this leads me to my second point. Again, we're dealing here with several points dealing with why we don't believe that the, uh, the church has replaced Israel. Uh, the second point is going to be that the Old Testament explicitly promises the perpetuity or the, continue, the continuing relevance of the nation Israel. And there's a passage here in Jeremiah 31 where I believe that God is really being as emphatic as he can be to emphasize that, that Israel as a nation is uh, something that will not be wiped out or will become irrelevant. The Old Testament explicitly promises the perpetuity of the nation Israel. And the statement is found in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 to 37. And Jeremiah 31 is a really important passage in Scripture, because in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, there's the promise of the new covenant, and the promise that God was going to give a new heart. He was going to, um, uh, they weren't going to be under the, the Mosaic law anymore. It wasn't like the covenant that they broke, but he was going to give them a new covenant. So in uh, Jeremiah 31, uh, verses 35 to 37. Uh, just listen to this. In verse 35, thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. And so one of the reasons why I think this passage is so significant is because you see here the significance you know, of, the, of the nation Israel. You know, in verse 36, when he says, you know, if this fixed order departs, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. So we actually see that, I guess what we could call the, the end, endless nature of the significance of Israel, or for a fancy word, the perpetuity 
of Israel is actually linked with, with the cosmic bodies. Uh, I guess to be practical, if you look outside and you can see the sun or you can see the moon or you can see the stars, you can know that God has not cast off Israel as a nation uh, in significance. So I think that passage goes a long way in refuting a replacement theology because it, it, it affirms the significance of Israel as a nation. And again, you know, for those who would hear this message originally, for the writer of Jeremiah, it's hard to envision this as being anything than um, the nation of Israel and the ethnic descendants of Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so that's the second point here. Now, the third one that we want to look at uh, which refutes replacement theology, is that the New Testament reaffirms the Old Testament expectation of a salvation and restoration of Israel. And, th and this is really important because, you know, up to this point, we've looked at a lot of passages. Most of them have been in the Old Testament, at least from the ones last night. And so uh, some may say, though, well, that's, that's the Old Testament. And, and there, there's a lot of people today who will say, well, the Old Testament, by nature, you know, it's shadowy, and it's types, and it's talking about things that they may not have understood the fullness of what was going to happen when the New Testament era comes. Um, so there are a lot of theologians who will actually say that the New Testament writers, they transcend the Old Testament, or, and some have even used the word reinterpret. Um, I won't go through a laundry list right now of theologians who have used that term, but there are a lot of even contemporary theologians who will say that the New Testament reinterprets the Old Testament. And I I think there's real serious problems with that concept. My view is that God got it right in the Old Testament, that there's no need for the New Testament to reinterpret or change the message of the Old Testament. But what's significant about these passages that we're going to look at is we see that it's not the case that the New Testament has reinterpreted or changed the message of the Old Testament, but that it affirms it. And one of these passages is, is Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. And so Jesus, you know, in coming off the encounter with the rich young ruler who wasn't willing to forsake all to follow Christ, so you have this interesting uh, encounter where a man was seeking eternal life, but he wasn't willing to come on Christ's terms and to be able to forsake all. And then there's a question by Peter in Matthew 19, 27, where Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you, what then will there be for us? And so, you know, Peter has forsaken, there's a sense in which he's forsaken all as, as well as the other apostles. And so he's asking Jesus, you know, what, what is the reward for this? And uh, I don't know about you, but when I read that question, sometimes it almost sounds a little bit um, unspiritual. It sounds a little bit selfish. Like, hey, what's, what's in it for us? We've left everything. You know, what, and so, but what's interesting, though, is, is Jesus, does, Jesus doesn't rebuke the question. He, he doesn't say it's unspiritual or you shouldn't be thinking like that or you know, anything like that. But Jesus' answer is really interesting because he says in verse 28 that Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that you who have followed me, and now he discusses um, the future. And I think it's pretty clear from what he's going to describe in the, in the rest of the verse here that these, these things are future from the standpoint now, things not fulfilled at the first coming, things that will be fulfilled at the second coming of Christ which leads to an important point, which is we, we, we need to understand that there are, because there are two comings of Jesus the Messiah, we should expect certain things to be fulfilled at his first coming and then other things to be fulfilled at his second coming. Uh, it's not the case that everything was fulfilled at the first coming, or it's also not the case that nothing was fulfilled at his first coming, and it'll all be at the second coming. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mix. It seems to me that the, uh, the emphasis with Christ's first coming is on his uh, role as the, as the suffering servant who brings atonement for sin, and yet there's kingdom and uh, restoration and those things coming with the second coming. But, but notice the things that he addresses here in the next part. He says, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, and the regeneration there refers to cosmic renewal, renewal of the earth. Um, if you want to read more about what that looks like, read Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. It's when creation is going to be set free from its corruption. And so it's a, it's a renewal. It's a renewal of all things. But Jesus says, in the regeneration, and it's at the time of the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. So it's interesting there is Jesus tells you when he's going to sit on his glorious throne. And I think the context here is the, the throne of David. 
Uh, in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 to 33, the angel Gabriel told Mary that, he was, that this son of hers was going to sit on the throne of his father David. And so the time of him sitting on his glorious throne will be at the time of the regeneration of the earth. And notice at the last part of it, the last part of the verse where it says, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And again, there's no reason at this point to understand Israel other than what Israel has been up until this point, <laughs> which referred to the, uh, to the ethnic uh, nation of Israel. And the fact that Jesus draws attention to the 12 tribes of Israel seems to indicate that there's a restoration of the tribes of Israel at this point. Because if you remember from your, your Old Testament, after the time of Solomon, there was a division of the tribes. You had the, uh, the two southern tribes and the ten northern tribes, and eventually they went into captivity there. So anyway, the, uh, that's talking about a restoration of Israel. It's talking about the judging of the 12 tribes of Israel, which seems to indicate that the apostles are going to actually be in ruling positions, and it's the time where Jesus is on his glorious throne. Um, since we're pretty close on this point, I might also draw your attention to Matthew 25. Uh, in Matthew 25, 31, Matthew chapter 25, 31, Jesus also tells you this about his throne. We're told here that when, oh, in Matthew 25, 31, Jesus says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. So it's really crystal clear at this point. What Jesus is talking about in Matthew 25, 31 is he's talking about his second coming. Right now, Jesus is currently at the right hand of the Father, sharing the throne of deity, you know, in connection with what Psalm 110.1 promised. But what he's talking about here is when he comes in his glory, when he comes with all of his angels, then he will sit on his glorious throne. So that's clearly talking about the second coming and his assumption of the Davidic throne. If you put this verse together with Matthew 19.28, it's at that time that the apostles also are going to be ruling over the 12 tribes of, of a restored Israel. So... I would take the Matthew 19.28, and certainly if you combine it with Matthew 25.31, to, to have a very strong indicator of the concept of a restoration of, of Israel. Um, another passage, since we're in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39, uh, you know, this is where Jesus is pronouncing judgment for Israel's unbelief shortly before his death. Um, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate, which means the prediction of the destruction of the temple. And then he says in verse 39, For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so that's, that's a prediction of a future day where Israel is going to um, cry out to the Messiah um, in, for salvation and in blessing. And that's a quote of Psalm 118, which is a psalm of blessing. So he predicts the day where Israel as a whole is going to uh, cry out to him. Uh, let's see, Luke, in Luke 21, 24, this is one that we've looked at in, in a previous time. Um, so I won't go there again, but that was a passage that talked about that uh, Jerusalem was going to be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So I think Luke 21, 24 is indicating that, you know, in this time period between the destruction of the temple in AD 70 and what's going to be taking place at the time of Christ's return, that there's a, eventually is going to come a time where uh, the trampling of the city of Jerusalem is going to be reversed and, uh, and Jerusalem would be restored. Uh, we will, though, look at Luke chapter 22, because this is also another passage dealing with, uh, with uh, implications in regard to Israel. Now, again, as you read this, you may say, hey, this sounds, a lot, this sounds a lot like what we just read in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, and, and it is very similar. But one of the things you should understand, uh, when Jesus made the statement in Matthew 19, 28 about the apostles ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel, that was at a much earlier day. This is actually taking place you know, in connection with the, with the Lord's Supper immediately before his death. And uh, as Jesus is getting ready to die, he speaks a lot about the kingdom of God in Luke chapter 22. Um, but starting in verse 28 and then emphasizing in verse 30, we're told, You are those who have stood by me in my trials. 
And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And so Jesus is promising the disciples there that when, you know, when his second coming occurs, they're going to eat and drink at his table in his kingdom. And I, I think Jesus is drawing upon language taken from Isaiah chapter 25, I think around verses 6 to 8. I don't have time to go there right now. Uh, but there's the promise that after a time of intense tribulation and day of the Lord wrath upon the world, um, there's going to be a messianic kingdom upon the earth. And uh, Isaiah 25 talks about a celebration banquet that is taking place in the kingdom. And it actually mentions real food. It talks about food, it talks about drink, and it talks about celebration at that time. So Jesus, even before his death, he's, he's looking beyond his death to kingdom conditions, and he promises that just as the Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And notice what he also tells him will happen this time, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So again, you see how significant, you know, even before his death, Jesus is looking forward to the restoration of Israel. Uh, the passage in Acts chapter 1, I mean, this is one that we, we, we looked at before. It may be worth mentioning again, particularly since in the context that we're, we're looking at here. But just to reiterate again, the, uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, we're told that the disciples had uh, 40 days of kingdom instruction from the risen Jesus. I think we're told in you know, Luke's gospel with the resurrection accounts that he had actually opened up the eyes of his disciples so that they could see and understand what was taking place. So he's speaking to them according to the end of verse 3 for 40 days, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So I think I mentioned before this had to be the, the greatest uh, seminary class ever given, 40 days with the risen Jesus on the, on the kingdom of God. And then in verse 6 it says, so when they had come together, they were asking him saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? What's important to understand there is after 40 days of instruction, they're expecting a restoration of the kingdom to Israel. And again, some people want to say they were wrong in that expectation, but I find that to be absolutely incredible and hard to believe um, that they could have all that instruction from Jesus and be uh, wrong on the nature of the kingdom. Je Jesus doesn't correct their view. As a matter of fact, I think his answer assumes the correctness that there would be a restoration of the kingdom. But basically what he says in verses 7 and 8 is, it's not for you to know the times are epic, but epics by which the Father is fixed by his own authority. So I think they had a right view of the nature of the kingdom, that it was going to be restored to national Israel, uh, and yet they were not to know the timing of that, because that's going to be connected with the timing um, of Jesus' return. Uh, what they are to focus on, according to verse 8, though, is is when you, uh, what you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So that, that's, what, that's what we're to be concerned with in this time before Jesus comes again, and that's where we fit as a church. We fit with the Great Commission. We, we are the ones who have been given the, uh, the, the baton of the gospel and the message of the kingdom to proclaim that to the nations today. We, we don't know when the kingdom is going to be established it, you know, the, the day of the Lord and the establishing of the kingdom and all those events could break forth very shortly or it may be some time. Um, but we're, what we're to be focused on is gospel proclamation. You know, Israel was called to be a shining city on a hill and to obey God's law so that the other nations would look in and be drawn to Israel's God. Uh, one of the things that we're called upon to do as the church is we're called to spread. We're, we're, we're to go to the nations that are currently hostile towards God and share the gospel and as that occurs, there will be people who become citizens of that kingdom and will enter that kingdom when, when Christ returns. So I think that's a very significant passage because it shows you that even after the resurrection and on the day of Jesus' ascension, that the apostles are still thinking of the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. And Jesus says, that is going to occur, but it's not for you to know. And what you're to focus on is, is gospel proclamation. And of course, I think that's very applicable um, to, where, to where we are today. Um, in Acts chapter 3, this is also a very important passage, uh, Acts chapter 3, verses 19 to 21. Uh, what's important to understand about Acts 3 is this is coming, you know, this is right on the heels of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the day of Pentecost, which is the birthday of the church, um, the new covenant and the indwelling Holy Spirit coming upon believers. And 
Uh, Peter's addressing the men of Israel according to verse 12. So in verse 12, he's addressing the men of Israel. This is in Jerusalem. You know, there to, all these people, you know, a lot of these people here would have been obviously familiar with the, with the death of Christ and all the events that were taking place and including the, rigid, the proximity of the religious leaders. And so in Acts 3.17, Peter says, Now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So we would call that an already fulfillment. You know, when it comes to what the prophets said about the suffering servant of the Lord, that has been fulfilled. That's a fulfillment of Isaiah 52 and 53 and Psalm 22 and all the passages that talk about the suffering of Christ and the atonement that he brings. That he brings. Those things have been fulfilled. And so what ends up happening in verse 19 is there's, he tells them what they need to do. Therefore, repent and return. In other words, get saved, <laughs> believe, turn from your sin, so that your sins may be wiped away. In other words, you'll, you'll find forgiveness. I mean, they're currently in a state of unbelief. We'll see more about what that unbelief means in the sermon that's coming up, because we're going to do a survey of Romans 11. But he tells them that if you repent, if you get saved, you're going to get uh, your sins wiped away. But notice there's another thing that will happen. In order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of the restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. So he's indicating here that there still needs to be a second coming of Christ, and if Israel will repent and return, they will have their sins forgiven, and that's linked with the return of Christ and what's called the times of refreshing and the restoration of all things. And I think those are, those are kingdom conditions. Those are the things that the Messiah brings with his second coming. And it's also important to understand that when Peter is talking about times of refreshing and the restoration of all things, that at the end of verse 21, these are things connected with the Old Testament. All things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. And we've talked about some of those passages already, the you know, kingdom passages where it talks about a restoration of Israel, blessing to the nations, but also, but, but also uh, harmony among the animal kingdom and nature being restored and crops growing like they should and houses being built and all those sorts of things. And so just as if you compare verses 18 and 21, remember how the Old Testament prophets predicted that the Christ would suffer and those things have been fulfilled? So too must it be literally the case that when Jesus comes, that there's going to be a restoration of all things of the things that the Old Testament prophets talked about. And so that's the come I believe that we do need to be studying our Old Testament, which is obviously the foundation for what's taking place in the New Testament. The New Testament is not reinterpreting the Old Testament, but as we saw in Matthew 5, 17 to 18, Jesus says every jot and tittle, every letter that was predicted in the law and the prophets is going to be fulfilled. And that's affirmed even after Jesus has ascended into heaven, and that includes, you know, what is taking place uh, with Israel. Okay, the next one I mentioned on the, the notes here is a passage. This is one we're going to be looking at next in the sermon, so I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because uh, I'm going to survey this whole chapter coming up here shortly. Um, but in Romans chapter 11, uh, verses 25 to 26 in particular, you know, we're told that you know, after a time of uh, the fullness of the Gentiles, we're told that all Israel will be saved. And so that, that's a statement of uh, the salvation of the nation Israel. And so, like I said, I'll say more about that coming up. I, I, did, want, I did want to read to you a quote from a uh, commentator named Cranfield, a very respected commentator um, on the book of Romans. And, and, and in his commentary, when he's dealing with the statement in Romans 11 that all Israel will be saved, um, he has, a, he has a, uh, an interesting statement here. He says, uh, I know it's probably a little bit hard to read up on the screen here, but I'll go ahead and read it for you. Cranfield said, it is only where the church persists in refusing to learn this message where it secretly, perhaps quite unconsciously, believes that its own existence is based on human achievement and so fails to understand God's mercy to itself that it is unable to believe in God's mercy for still unbelieving Israel and so entertains the ugly 
and unscriptural notion that God has cast off his people, Israel, and simply replaced it by the Christian church. These three chapters emphatically forbid, and he's talking about Romans 9 to 11, emphatically forbid us to speak of the church as having once for all taken the place of the Jewish people. And so that's, a, that's a, quite a statement there is you know, on that. And what's also interesting, too, about Cranfield is he's actually an individual who, who says that he used to believe in replacement theology. But as he studied you know, Romans 9 to 11 and the statement that all Israel will be saved, um, that that caused him to you know, change his position and to understand that there was a future, a future for Israel. Uh, jo- the great Jonathan Edwards said, nothing is more certainly foretold than this national conversion of the Jews in Romans 11. All right, that brings us to a next point here, number four. Uh, again, this is a, would be a fourth reason why replacement theology is not a biblical doctrine. Uh, number four, the New Testament explicitly states that the Old Testament promises and covenants to Israel are still the possession of Israel, even during this church age and even while the nation is currently in a state of unbelief. And that's Romans 9. I guess I have it right here on the screen, so I'll go ahead and read it from here. But, but this is interesting here because when, he, when, when Paul's writing Romans, the church has already been around for a couple decades. You know, it's been around for like 20 years. And so, and obviously the understanding of things, you know, that there would be some time to think through some of the issues. But what's interesting in Romans 9, he says, he refers to my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. And this is interesting. So he's clearly talking about ethnic Israel here. You know, he's talking about Israelites, kinsmen according to the flesh, because remember, Paul was Jewish. And he says, to whom belongs. And that's important. He doesn't say to whom once belonged, or to whom it once belonged, but no longer belongs to them, or to whom it once belonged, but now it has been transferred to another. He says here, to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory. Notice he also mentions, though, and the covenants. The covenants of Scripture, Abrahamic covenant, New Covenant, Davidic covenant, and the giving of the law. And notice he also mentions the temple service and the promises. In this particular case, would you again draw your attention to the statement that to Israelites it belongs the covenants, that belongs the promises, belongs the temple service, which indicates that those things have not been forfeited. And that's something he's going to bring up in Romans 11 because they're going to He's going to address some who believe that God has cast away his people Israel. And he says that's not the case. He says, to whom belongs? And there, there is a sense in which God, because of his covenant faithfulness, has not rejected Israel. Now, I want to be clear here. This is not a statement that unbelieving Israel is experiencing the blessings of these things. The Old Testament and the New Testament are very clear that there has to be repentance. Remember what Peter said in Acts 3? Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. Uh, In Leviticus chapter 26, verses 40 to 45, it was promised that if a judged and dispersed Israel would return and repent, that they would be connected to the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant again, and that they would be brought into their land. So we're we're not talking about unbelieving Israel experiencing the fullness. One must be, one must have faith in order to experience those things. But but Paul does indicate that those things, you know, still belong to Israel. And then later when you get to Romans 11, he even explains more why that's the case. And that's something that we'll talk more about in the next, you know, coming up in the, in the main service. Okay, a fifth point that I would like to mention here is that the New Testament indicates that God is faithful to Israel because of his promises to the patriarchs of Israel. So again, a, a little preview of the message coming up. I just draw your attention to Romans 11, Romans 11, 28. Now again, this, this is in the context of the statement in Romans eleven twenty six 26, that all Israel will be saved. But, but what I really wanted to focus on here is God takes very seriously what he promised to the patriarchs of Israel. What God promised to them, he is going to literally fulfill. He doesn't change trajectory. He doesn't do something totally different than what he said he would do. So we're told in verse 28 that from the standpoint of the gospel, they, and that's, the context is Israel currently in a state of unbelief, they are enemies for your sake. You know, they've stumbled over the gospel at this current time. They haven't believed. They persecute you know, those who are, and don't like those who have trusted in Christ. So from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake because they haven't believed yet. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. 
And that's interesting because now when you're getting into God's choice, you're getting into God's electing purposes and, and how sure those are. And it's also connected with them being beloved for the sake of the fathers, which is another way of saying God's going to be faithful to his covenant. He's going to fulfill everything that he says he, w- says he will. And of course, in the book of uh, Romans, um, God's faithfulness to Israel is one of the reasons why we as a church can, be, can, be, can understand that God is going to be faithful to what he has promised us. Because we look and we see that God has been faithful to Israel, is faithful to Israel, he will keep his promises, and the same is true for us as well. Uh, point number six, the New Testament indicates that Israel's election and calling is irrevocable. And so, uh, I don't, we're not going to turn to Deuteronomy 7, chapter 7, verse 6 to 8, but if you were to, if you were to look at that passage, you will see that that's, that's a clear statement that God has chosen Israel He didn't choose them because they were so great or so mighty or better than other people, but with his sovereign electing purposes, he chose chose to do so. But when you look at Romans 11, 29, coming coming off the statement that, you know, from that their beloved for the sake of the fathers, we're told that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So in other words, if God calls a people and he has a plan for the nation of Israel, that's an irrevocable calling. That is something that still needs uh, to come to fruition, and it still uh, needs to happen. All right, number seven. Uh, the New Testament never uses the term Israel for those who are not ethnic Jews, and thus the church is, is never called Israel. And so I, I feel pretty strongly about that. There ends up being some, um, particularly, one or, particularly one verse in particular that sometimes has been challenged in that regard. Uh, and I, I may say some words on that, but The title Israel is used 73 times, and we're we're talking about here, in the New Testament, and always refers to ethnic Jews. In other words, I don't think there's any reference to Israel in the New Testament that does not have an an ethnic understanding. Now, there will be times, like in Romans 9, 6, where it's referred more specifically to believing Jews. So sometimes the title can be used to ethnic Jews who have believed. But there's never a time where Israel is used in a sense that doesn't have an ethnic understanding. So I think that's pretty significant. Also point B here, the New Testament still consistently refers to Israel as Israel even after the establishment of the church. And I think that's real important here. Uh, As a matter of fact, I think one, one example in particular, as I mentioned here on point C, is that the book of Acts, again, remember, with the book of Acts, you have, first of all, you have the author, Luke. Remember, remember Luke wrote, Luke, and the book of Acts. Uh, you want to know how many times the word church is referred to in the gospel of Luke? Zero. <laughs> There's zero references to church. When you get to the book of Acts and you have the events following the pouring out of the Spirit and the beginning of the New Covenant era um, and, the, and the indwelling Holy Spirit for believers, you start to have many references to, to the church. So the book of Acts maintains a distinction between Israel and the church, In Acts, both Israel and the church exist simultaneously. They're both around. Israel is used 20 times. And then the the term for church, ecclesia, is used 19 times. Yet the two groups are always kept distinct. So in other words, Israel is still Israel. As a matter of fact, if you want to read the very last half of the last chapter of the book of Acts, it talks about the fact that Paul meets with leading representatives of Israel to convince them about Jesus being Messiah and about the kingdom of God. And then some believe, but most of them didn't. And then he quotes you know, an Isaiah passage indicating that they have a, they have a hard heart. So um, the church in Israel are, are kept distinct in the uh, very uh, important uh, book of Acts. Uh, closely connected is I don't think that those who hold to a, you know, a supersessionist or a replacement view I don't think they have successfully showed that there's any uh, passages where the New Testament identifies the church as Israel. Um, There's been three passages that they've offered to try to say that the church is called Israel. Uh, One of them is Romans uh, Romans, um, 11, 25, and 26, where where some think that all Israel who will be saved is the church. That's roundly rejected even by most people who hold a replacement theology (laughs) because the context is so strong in Romans 11 that that, that Israel is ethnic Israel. So all of a sudden, in verse 26, to say, hey, this is referring to the church and it doesn't have any ethnic connections, that, that, that's, been, that's been roundly rejected, even by, even by staunch holders of, uh, you know, of replacement theology. 
Uh, in Romans chapter 9, verse 6, Paul talks about, you know, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Um, I think what he's talking about there is uh, there, there, there does end up being the true Israel, I mean, in addition to Christ, or those who I identify with Christ, those who, I, I think the Israel of Romans 9, 6 refers to ethnic Jews who have believed. It's not just enough to be a Jew. Ethnically, to be saved and part of God's kingdom, one must have faith. So I think in Romans 9, 6, he's appealing to that. Uh, the, the one in particular, though, that, they're, they're, that I will let you know that those who hold a replacement view um, hold on to strongly, even though, even though I think that, that, that is, it's been soundly refuted, their view has been, not, um, Galatians 6.16, um, Paul's talking about, he, he's dealing with uh, Judaizers who've tried to pervert the gospel by adding works of the Mosaic law to faith. In other words, they're trying to add, um, his enemies are trying to add works to faith. And he says, in uh, verse 15, for neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And then he says in Galatians 6.16, and those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So some people want to say, well, the Israel of God there you know, refers to people, all people, whether Jew or Gentile, who have believed in the gospel through faith. I think what he's doing here is I think this Israel of God is a reference to believing Jews. If, if, if you read Galatians, he's been really hard on Jewish false teachers are trying to add works to faith. And I think when he talks about the Israel of God here, he, he, he's acknowledging that not all Jews have fallen for the error of the Judaizers, that there's some Jews who have accepted the gospel of, of grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone, and refers to them as the Israel of God. So in that sense, the Israel of God, in its truest sense, are ethnic Jews who have believed in Christ. But to put it all together, I think it's significant that there are there's no New Testament references where the church is referred to as Israel. Um, on this next point here, I'm, I'm not going to talk about, th this one's a real complicated point, probably could have its own message, but um, basically what I'm saying in, in point number nine is that I don't, I don't think the case has been, has been adequately proven that the New Testament reinterprets the Old Testament. Uh, I think the New Testament reaffirms the message of the Old Testament. Of course, it adds new information at times, um, but I don't think it's the case that the New Testament changes the expectation of the Old Testament. The Old Testament talked about a restoration of a restored Israel. The New Testament talks about a restored Israel. Um, the Old Testament talked about a restored Jerusalem. Jesus indicated in Luke 21, 24 that there would be a time where Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem's trampling would be reversed. Uh, if you read 2 Thessalonians chap uh, chapter 2, Paul's writing, again, 20 years after the church has begun, and he talks about the fact that there's going to be a temple of which a man of lawlessness or an antichrist figure is going to enter someday and declaring himself to be God. Uh, he's clearly relying on what Daniel talked about in Daniel chapter 9, about an evil um, prince figure who would go into the Jewish temple and desecrate it. Uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, you know, is talking about events concerning the land of Judea and, and those certain sorts of things. So um, all I'm saying here is when I, when, I, when I study the evidence, it seems to me that the New Testament does not rewrite or reinterpret the Old Testament or change the story, but it continues with it uh, pretty literally. Okay, my next point here is... Um, this is actually an issue I'm going to talk a little bit more about tonight, the Ephesians 2 passage, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put that to the side for now. Um, but just to mention you know, some, of the, some of the other points that are... Um, I do want to mention the, the issue here of... Uh, there's no doubt that when you read the New Testament that there's language that's, that was used of Israel in the Old Testament that is applied to the church. Um, and in other words, the church is called the people of God. You read passages like 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10, there's language used of Israel in the Old Testament that's being used of people in the church age. If you read Romans chapter 9, verses 24 to 26, um, Gentiles are being uh, called the people of God. And so what, what happens when, the church, when there's language used of Israel that's applied to the church? What I would say what is taking place there is exactly what the Old Testament predicted, particularly in Isaiah 19, verses 24 to 25. If you remember in that passage, which we looked at in a previous section, it was promised that in the days of the kingdom, in those days, that, e that there was going to come a day in which um, people groups like Egypt and Assyria were going to be called the people of God. As a matter of fact, in 
Isaiah 19, 24 to 25, it says, Egypt will be called my people. So it's important to understand that uh, this is the way that I like to word it. Uh, the concept of Israel does not expand to include Gentiles, but the concept of the people of God expands to include believing Gentiles alongside believing Jews. So in other words, there's no doubt that there's language used of Israel in the Old Testament that is now applied to believing Gentiles and applied to the church, but that's just consistent with what the Old Testament predicted with you know, the, the coming of the Messiah and those conditions. So uh, the fact that the church is called the people of God you know, just indicates that the concept of the people of God has been expanded. But if you remember in that Isaiah 19 passage, as Egypt becomes the people of God, we still have Israel mentioned. You know, Israel is my inheritance. So Israel uh, still exists. So, okay. And, and then lastly, on the last point here, as we get close to wrap up, I, I think this is a pretty important one, that New Testament prophecy st still refers to Israel as having significance, thus indicating that God's plans for Israel is alive. Uh, for example, in uh, Revelation chapter 7, you know, when we're dealing with, with future events, um, there's significance given. I won't read this whole passage because it's basically a mentioning of the 12 tribes of Israel. But in Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 to 8, <clears throat> I heard the number of those who were sealed, 140,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So it's, it's mentioning the ethnic tribes of Israel there. That's contrasted in verse 9, where verse 9 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So it's interesting, in Romans chapter 7, it talks about the tribes of Israel, and then it talks about um, Gentile groups, nations, tribes, peoples that have also been saved, which, which again, totally consistent with the message of the Bible that the ultimate Israelite Jesus is saving and restoring Israel, and he's bringing blessings to the, to the Gentiles of the world as well. But it's important that those two groups are distinguished. Uh, when you look at uh, Revelation chapter 11, uh, you know, verse 1, it says, There was given to me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Uh, leave out the court which is outside in the temple and do not measure, for it has been given to the nation. So, that's talking about you know, the trampling um, of Jerusalem with implications for the temple. You know, if you were to read Revelation chapter 12, the woman who gives birth that faces the wrath of the dragon, you know, that's clearly a reference to Israel. Uh, even when you read uh, Revelation chapter 20, you know, it talks about the fact at the end of the millennium that there's going to be uh, an attack against the beloved city, you know, which, is, which is a reference to Jerusalem. Uh, if you look in Matthew chapter 24, Verses 15 and following, this is Jesus talking about prophetic details before his death. He says in Matthew 24, 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. So it's interesting here, he's talking about an abomination of desolation. He's, and he actually tells you that he's referring to Daniel. And this is actually a reference to Daniel 9, 27. And so Jesus is relying literally on the literal, uh, you know, on the meaning of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, talking about an abomination of desolation, which is an event in the Jewish temple. This has implications for those who are in Judea. And so, and even throughout Matthew 24, there's all kinds of references to the Old Testament. There's references to Isaiah 13 in regard to cosmic signs. And so there's all kinds of things there indicating that uh, Jesus still viewed Old Testament prophecies concerning Israel as being significant. So well, the very fact that Jesus and Paul and the New Testament writers are literally relying on Old Testament passages regarding Israel, that tells us that we should as well. Uh, they're not reinterpreting the Old Testament. Um, they're taking it quite literally. So, so like I said, if you put those points together, some of them we spent more time on than others, um, I think the case is pretty clear uh, that, um, that replacement theology is, is not a biblical doctrine and that we can trust all the promises that God has said, we can, we can take them literally, and they will be fulfilled through Jesus, who's the ultimate man and the ultimate Israel. That fulfillment is not absorbment of the details where the details no, no longer matter, but it, Jesus, through his two comings, um, will fulfill all of those things.
And so what we'll be talking about next is, a, in, in, obviously in, in the next hour coming up with the church service, we'll, be, um, we'll do a survey of Romans 11. All right, let's pray. Father, we just, uh, again, thank you for your word, and we thank you for the passages we're able to look at. Uh, Lord, we just thank you that there's consistency in your word, and we just thank you the fact that you are a covenant-keeping God, you're faithful to what you promised the patriarchs, you're faithful to your name, and that as we as a church look at how you will fulfill your promises with Israel, our hearts are encouraged because we know that as you save us and you work with us, that you will be faithful to complete what you have begun in us, because if it was up to us, we would be lost, we would go to hell, we would, if we could lose our salvation, we would, but Lord, you're the one who keeps us, and we're thank you, thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen.